celebrate the science that you've all been up to as well, which I'm really excited about. And uh, I'd like to like to uh, kick things off. I'll just uh, get my slides up here. I need, it, this says that I'm, uh, the host needs to allow me to share my slides. Oh, yes, one moment, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Oh, one second, one second. Yeah, no worries. Got a lot of okay. things. You okay. should be able to share now. Uh, yes, that looks good. Okay. Um, great. So I, I uh, like I said, I, I'm really excited to be here. And, I, I want to. I hope this can be a little bit of a more of an informal chat uh, with all of you. I'd like to talk about some of our science. I'm going to talk about some of the things that I've been up to at Berkeley, just down the street from BHS, this year during this uh, you know crazy year of the pandemic and how we've been trying to deal with that in our laboratories. And uh, and then of course at the end we will uh, celebrate the science that you've all been doing. And I, I put CRISPRology on here because, um, you know, my, my, as I'll describe to you briefly today, my research has really, um, you know, kind of evolved from CRISPR being a very small part of our research program at UC Berkeley to now it taking over kind of everything that I'm doing, which is uh, really exciting, but it's, it's also meant to, that I've had to make some big changes in not only my, my research lab, but also how I spend my time and what I think about every day. Because as I'll tell you, CRISPR is a lot more than just the science. It's now also a technology that has profound ethical and societal implications that I've gotten involved in discussing with uh, an international scientific community. So to kick us off, so this is uh, what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about what is CRISPR and where did it come from and why are, why are people excited about it. Uh, we'll talk about CRISPR as a technology for genome editing, what that is, and why, again, why is that interesting and how is it going to impact any of us. And then finally, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll discuss the, the past you know, crazy year that we've all been through and how the CRISPR technology is actually allowing us to address the current coronavirus pandemic and also think about how we can organize ourselves as scientists and use technologies like CRISPR for pandemic preparedness, getting ready for you know, future challenges from viruses. We know they're out there. But let me start with CRISPR. So, um, so what is CRISPR? And it, it, it's a, uh, it's gained uh, you know, attention because it's a tool that allows scientists to change the DNA sequence in a cell and to do that in a precise fashion. And for those of you that are coders, you might be interested to know that it's literally a programmable tool, and I'll tell you how that works in a moment, and it, it's acting on the code of life. So it's acting on DNA. And it's literally a molecule that's shown here in green. It's a protein that uses a zip code, a molecule called RNA in yellow, that provides the information for this molecule to bind DNA, to find a particular set of letters, 20 letters in a DNA sequence, and make a precise cut in the DNA. And so this is a, this is a, a, a protein that's naturally found in bacteria, and I wanted to show you a, a little video that shows how it actually works. And so this is a, we're looking here inside of, we're looking on a, a slide where the Cas9 protein is labeled, it's holding on to DNA, and keep watching, there it is, it cuts the DNA. So this is a, a mechanism, it's literally like a molecular scissors that grabs onto DNA at a particular place and cuts the, 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 the DNA. And you probably know that DNA is a double helix. And so it really has to deal with two strands of that DNA molecule and it cuts both of them. So it's like cutting a rope. And, um, and so uh, this, this is actually a molecule that came to the attention of scientists because it's part of a bacterial immune system. It's part of a way 
that bacteria can defend themselves against virus infections. So we're looking here at a, this is a, what's called a scanning electron micrograph of a bacterial cell that's being infected by viruses. And these viruses are literally injecting their genetic material into the cell. And you probably know that when a virus infects a cell, what it does is reprogram the cell. It literally grabs, it takes over the cell's machinery uh, to make more viruses. So it's a kind of a selfish type of genetic element. And, and of course, uh, bacteria like, like humans and most other organisms have to deal with viruses in the environment. And so bacteria like, like humans have evolved a number of ways to fight viruses. And one of the ways they do it is through the CRISPR immune system. And it was really by the, through the attention of just a few scientists in the beginning, some of them right here at Berkeley, at UC Berkeley, who were studying this immune system that the CRISPR technology came about. We realized how it could be used for uh, genome editing. And so how did that happen? Well, so here's a cartoon that just illustrates the way the CRISPR system works in bacteria. And so I'll just walk you through this cartoon. So we have a bacterial cell that's being infected by a couple of viruses in this example. And the really cool thing about CRISPR is that it gives bacteria a way to store the DNA of the virus in the bacterial chromosome, in the bacterial DNA itself. And the way this happens is that the, uh, the CRISPR system grabs a little piece of the viral DNA and integrates it into the host chromosome, not randomly, but in a special place known as the CRISPR. And so back, to, back when uh, scientists were first discovering these systems, the way they were identified was the fact, was through the fact that if you sequence bacterial genomes, you find lots of examples of places in the DNA where there are repeated sequences. That's what these R's stand for, is repeats. So you'd find a 30 letter repeat in the DNA that occurs over and over that flanks sequences that seemed, were seemingly random initially. They seem to be, these S uh, uh, labeled boxes were random sequences that no one knew where they came from until somebody figured out that they actually come from viruses. They match the sequences of viruses that, that can infect these bacteria. So the bacteria are storing a, a genetic record. And for those of us that remember such things, and actually now we all know about these, uh, vaccination cards. This is like a genetic vaccination card. It's a genetic record of past viral infections that this bacterium has experienced. So why would a virus want to, uh, why would a bacterium want to do that? Why store little pieces of viral DNA in the genome? And the reason is that it creates a great mechanism for finding and destroying those viruses if they try to show up again in the cell. And here's how that works. The cell takes this CRISPR sequence, it makes a transcript called an RNA molecule, a copy of the CRISPR sequence in the form of RNA, that is then uh, chopped into, processed into shorter bits that each include a sequence that comes from the virus shown by these colored bars and sequences that mark it as a CRISPR RNA. So those are the same in every CRISPR RNA, the sequences shown in black. And they combine with the, the uh, CRISPR protein to allow that protein to find DNA sequences matching the guide RNA and cutting them. And so once that cutting occurs, then the bacterial cell can further destroy the viral genetic material and prevent it from killing the cell. So pretty nifty um, pathway in bacteria, which is why we started studying this originally. And I wanted to show you a quick video that just puts all of those steps together. So here we see some bacterial cells growing in the environment. And when they get infected by a virus, if they have the CRISPR system, they can integrate a piece of the viral DNA into the CRISPR part of the chromosome. And there are those repeated sequences that flank these integrated bits that come from viruses. The cell is then able to make a molecular copy of that sequence in the form of RNA. 
that RNA is chopped into shorter bits that include each of them one sequence from a virus. And then together with a second kind of RNA called tracer, this RNA combines with Cas9, a protein that's made in the CRISPR system, to create surveillance complexes. These can search the cell looking for DNA sequences that match the sequence in the guide RNA. That match triggers DNA unwinding, and then the Cas9 can cut the DNA in bacteria. That cutting triggers rapid DNA destruction. So a really cool way that these bacteria can, in real time, acquire immunity to, to viruses, something that, that you know, pretty, we, we, all, we can all relate to the utility of that, especially right now. And so in our own research uh, with Emmanuel Charpentier, a, a wonderful collaborator of ours, uh, a Parisian by, by birth, but who was working at the time in Sweden, we began a collaboration to understand exactly how this works. We wondered, how is it that that system allows bacteria to destroy viral DNA? And we figured out that this protein known as Cas9 uses the two RNAs that I mentioned, the CRISPR RNA and the tracer RNA to create a functional complex that uses this RNA as a literal zip code. It allows the Cas9 protein to recognize that particular DNA sequence. And here's where the programming part comes in. Importantly, this sequence can be altered easily. It can be altered in bacteria, but we can also change it easily in the laboratory. And that means that scientists can easily control Cas9, tell it to go to a particular piece of DNA and make a cut. That sounds like kind of a, maybe a cool little widget, but it gets better. Um, and so when, when uh, Martin Yinek and Chris Chylinski, the two scientists in our laboratories who were doing this research, were studying Cas9, they actually figured out that they could simplify the RNA zip code compared to what nature has done by making it into a single molecule, a single guide RNA that would have the handle for Cas9 assembly over here and the sequence for DNA binding over here. And this is the part of the RNA that can be changed easily to allow Cas9 to recognize any desired sequence. And so this you know, then becomes a, a, a relatively simple system for cutting DNA. And the reason this became a powerful technology is that it takes advantage of a very important part of DNA repair that happens in human and plant and animal cells, but not so efficiently in bacteria, which is that in our cells, when DNA experiences a double-stranded break, and that happens normally during cell division or during various kinds of DNA damage, the cell doesn't destroy the DNA, it actually finds the broken ends and repairs them. And so the repair involves sometimes making a small change to the DNA sequence during the repair process, or in some cases by integrating a new sequence of DNA that literally inserts new genetic information, but exactly at the position of the original DNA cut. And so if you start putting those pieces together, you realize that you know, if you were able to use uh, a tool like Cas9 as the scissors to cut DNA and you can tell it where to cut, you could trigger the cell to change the DNA sequence at that position through these repair pathways. And that's exactly how Cas9 as a genome editing tool works. And so here's, a, here's again a video that allows us to imagine this. So imagine we're in a eukaryotic cell where the DNA is inside the nucleus. And here's Cas9 with its guide RNA. It's searching through the genome, looking for a sequence that matches the sequence of the guide. And when that match occurs, the protein is able to unwind the DNA. It forms an RNA DNA helix inside the protein. You can see it right there. And it cuts each strand of the DNA, just like a rope. And then in these cells, instead of degrading the DNA, that cutting leads to repair by handing off the broken ends to other proteins that take over, repair the DNA, and 
introduce a change to the DNA sequence right at the place where the cut occurred. And so that's actually the, that's the actual editing part is where the cell takes over and repairs the broken DNA. And so once, once uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and I had, and, our, and our, uh, our lab members had published this research back in the summer of 2012, it was a very exciting time for us because um, I can tell you that you know, I've been doing science for a while now and um, you know, I, I love being a scientist, but you have to be patient because a lot of experiments don't work. A lot of ideas don't, don't pan out, but this was one where when we did this research, we realized that this was going to have a very important impact on anything that has DNA in it. So anything uh, in, in biology because of the ability to manipulate DNA in a way that had not previously been possible and certainly not as easy as it was with Cas9. And so I wanted to briefly just tell you uh, how this is currently being used. And you know what's exciting is that it's a tool that affects basic research, meaning that it gives scientists who are working away in laboratories a great way to manipulate DNA sequences in a precise fashion. So now we can, you know, we can try to perturb genes and understand their functions. We can, because Cas9 is programmable and we can program it with multiple guide RNAs in the same cell, that means that we can do things like cut out a piece of the genome, we can cut out a gene, we can trigger changes in multiple genes at the same time to understand how they interact. Those kinds of experiments are now going on in many different biological systems, human cells, animals, plants, et cetera. And so this has really opened the door to all kinds of fundamental discoveries in science that were not previously accessible because we just didn't have the tools to manipulate genes that way. But in, in terms of um, kind of tangible applications, it's been also very exciting to see how rapidly CRISPR-Cas9 is developing as a tool in the clinic, so for medical purposes, as well as for applications in agriculture. I wanted to give you one very specific example in biomedicine where CRISPR-Cas9 is already having a real world impact on people that are affected with a genetic disease known as sickle cell disease. So this is a disorder of the blood it's been known for a long time. It's existed for a long, long time, this mutation in the human population because people that inherit one copy of the sickle cell gene have protection from malaria. So this is a, a, a it can be a useful mutation if you inherit one copy of it and one copy of the normal uh, gene encoding hemoglobin, which is a blood uh, protein important for carrying oxygen in our blood. But if somebody inherits two copies of this sickle cell form of the hemoglobin gene, then they end up producing a mutated form of hemoglobin that is prone to aggregation. And it gives rise to sickle shaped cells, red blood cells that cause all kinds of physiological problems for them, including organ damage and, and you know, very, it's very painful uh, disease. And it often leads to early death. And so this is a great example of science, you know, if we go back a number of decades, figuring out the cause of this disease, but until recently, we had no way to actually treat it at its source. And this is what's so exciting about CRISPR, because it's a tool that can literally allow scientists to change that mutated base pair in the hemoglobin gene back to the, what we call the wild type or the sort of the, the um, normal form of that, that uh, gene so that those people now produce a normal form of hemoglobin and they're not subject to sickle cell disease anymore. And so this was honestly very exciting to see that this was one of the first uses of CRISPR in the laboratory that scientists were able to take cells that came from sickle cell patients and show that in those cells, CRISPR could be used to correct the disease causing mutation. Um, and then we fast forward a few years, and we're now at a point where about 30 people in a clinical trial have actually been treated with CRISPR for their sickle cell disease. And this is a picture of Victoria Gray, 
who was the first United States patient to be treated with CRISPR for her sickle cell disease. And she made headlines over the last two years because she's done very well. And this, this treatment has been highly effective at, um, at basically um, you know, curing her of sickle cell disease, which is quite extraordinary. So I'm you know, very excited about this. And I think this is, this is really uh, providing an example of what we're gonna see more and more in the future where CRISPR increasingly is used to deal with genetic diseases at their source, at the actual gene that causes the disease. So that's really exciting. I do wanna point out that right now, a therapy like that for Victoria Gray costs a couple of million dollars. So it's very expensive. And so one of the reasons that I started the Innovative Genomics Institute here in the Bay Area and at UC Berkeley and UCSF is that as a public university, I feel that one of our important missions is to make sure that our ideas, our discoveries, our technologies are ultimately made widely available and affordable to everyone that can benefit from them. So in the future, I imagine a future where everyone that can benefit from CRISPR can get access to it. That's a tall order. We have to figure out how to reduce the cost of the technology and make it easier to use it. So for example, we hope that one day patients like Victoria Gray can be treated with CRISPR, but without requiring a bone marrow transplant, which is currently the way that the CRISPR technology is delivered to their blood cells. I think that would be certainly one important way to make the technology more widely available, less expensive, and most importantly, less disruptive for the patient. So I, I wanna point out something else about CRISPR and this gets to some of the ethical challenges. So if you start thinking about a technology that allows precise manipulation of DNA and genes, um, and you think about the different ways that that could be used, one uh, application of CRISPR that came to the attention of scientists very early on in the, in the development of the technology was the possibility that it could be used in human embryos. So it could be used to make changes in genes that would in, and in a type of cell that can give rise to all of the cells in the body of an individual if those edited embryos are implanted to create a pregnancy. So that's very different from the therapy used for Victoria Gray where the CRISPR technology is only affecting her body. It's not creating heritable changes in her DNA. But the, if this is done in embryos, that's a different story. So um, back in 2015, I started to, you know, uh, probably before that actually, you know, realize that this was, this was a, a very real possibility with CRISPR and that it raised a lot of very profound ethical and societal questions about how the technology would be used in the future. And I'm very uh, pleased that at Berkeley, we were able to organize the first meeting about this topic, about human germline editing. And this has led to now uh, two international summits on the topic and, a, and a, a, an important report that I'm showing you here that was released by the National Academies that looked into this and made recommendations for scientists around the world as they go forward with their work using CRISPR. And I just actually yesterday joined the co-organizing committee for the next international summit, which is happening next year in London, is being reorganized by the Royal Society and a number of other scientific societies around the world. So it's become a, a topic of global discussion. And I think that's critical because of the power of, and, and importance of responsible use of the CRISPR technology. So uh, in the last part of the talk, I want to now turn to the, you know, the crazy year that we've all been through with coronavirus and, um, and talk to you a little more personally about how this has impacted my scientific team at Berkeley and at the Innovative Genomics Institute. So if we go back, uh, sort of rewinding the clock back to last spring when, you know, many of us were just starting to become aware that there was a virus that was, uh, had you know, first been detected in China and that this virus was highly infectious and, um, and was uh, quite dangerous because it caused a, a very severe respiratory disease. And so going back uh, to last spring, I held a meeting in 
um, middle of March with my, my team, my, lab, my research laboratory, my students, my postdocs, and with many of our colleagues. And even then we were all doing it by Zoom. We were you know, already realizing we needed to be socially distanced. And, um, and uh, we asked ourselves, what can we do as scientists? How do we take uh, what we know how to do and turn that expertise to, uh, to bear on this really um, you know, important public health problem that we're all facing. And I don't think any of us even knew how big of a problem it was at that time. But one of the things that came out of that meeting was that we realized that one of the most important things we could do immediately was to get going on more testing because we realized that if we looked across the United States and in other countries, testing was woefully inadequate to detect this virus. We didn't have the capacity to do it. And, uh, and there was just a huge unmet medical need. So we you know, said, uh, you know, let, let's, let's figure this out. And these are just a few examples of, you know, that kind of point to the urgent need that we could see right in our own community. So the Student Health Center, the Tang Center at UC Berkeley told us we have a, a, a student who tested positive and it took us a week to find out. So, you know, dangerous uh, time for that person to potentially be spreading the virus without realizing it. Children's Hospital of Oakland told us that when they went to get samples tested, they had to wait uh, many days at these uh, commercial testing labs like Quest, and the charge was $200 a test. So clearly not viable. And the Berkeley Fire Department had a case of a uh, po a firefighter who tested positive and they had a very dangerous situation where that person exposed 30 other firefighters and they had to decide, are we going to quarantine all of them or do we allow them to continue firefighting? What do we, what do we do? And so these just speak to the urgency of testing. And so the question was, what do, how do we do this? And of course, uh, there was a good uh, technology for testing called the polymerase chain reaction or PCR which we all, you know, if we work, if you uh, probably a lot of you have done this in laboratories, uh, if you work in a professional molecular biology lab, it's a technique that we use daily. So we all know how to do it. Our students know how to do it. But our question was, how do we take that knowledge and turn it into a clinically useful testing laboratory? And so um, I have to give a huge shout out to these folks here. And this is, by the way, just a, a small subset of the team that pitched in. But I posted a note on Slack through our Slack channel at the Innovative Genomics Institute asking for students and postdocs that would like to volunteer to set up a clinical testing lab at Berkeley that would handle clinical samples that would be funded by philanthropy and would use the polymerase chain reaction to detect the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We got over 800 volunteers in 24 hours, a huge number of people. There was an enormous uh, desire on the part of the scientific community to pitch in. Everybody wanted to roll up their sleeves and get this done. And so this team got together and in the, in the sort of the behind the stairway here in the back of this building, we carved out a 1,000 square foot space where we could put robots that would run a robotic PCR reaction to detect SARS-CoV-2. And we set this up as a clinically certified lab. And CLIA is an acronym that just means that this lab is, has state and federal uh, regulatory approval to handle human patient clinical samples in a, uh, a way that maintains patient confidentiality and has a level of accuracy that you can trust. So we had to do, yeah, that's a high bar and we had to, we had to meet it. And that was very important. Um, and by the way, we actually had to go to the um, highest levels of government. So we went to, in, in the state of California, we had to go to the governor's office to get approval for this and have, uh, get help getting this lab certified as well as to the president of the University of California system because partly because Berkeley uh, campus does not have a medical school. So this was the very first time that we were getting a, uh, a clinical testing laboratory going on our campus. So we set this up in about three weeks and started testing samples. And now uh, we've tested uh, well over a quarter of a million samples. 
We've done virtually all of the testing for the Berkeley campus over the last year, as well as working with a number of our community healthcare partners. And all of this was done uh, by coordination over Zoom. So many of us, in fact, had never even met in person because these were folks that came from all across the campus from different labs. We didn't know each other, but we teamed up, we figured out who knew how to do what, and we just organized the group into an effective team that would build the test, get it uh, validated for, for clinical use, and then start running it with robots so that we could run it in very high throughput with lots and lots of samples and do it accurately and safely and protect uh, sample data for confidentiality. And so this is the team. So uh, this is, uh, I, I love this. Uh, if you go to our innovativegenomics.org website, you can uh, find this. I like stop talking. She, she changed subjects and... Um, I'm gonna keep, keep going here, I'm almost done. Uh, these are just cartoons of some of the different members of the testing laboratory and quotes about their work. So you can check that out if you want. And, um, and then I wanted to show a couple of pictures of the people that started to use the lab in those very early days. And this is actually receiving some of the first samples from the Berkeley Fire Department when we started to work with them. And imagine, here we have the Berkeley Fire Department. They really had nowhere else to go to get their firefighters tested for SARS-CoV-2 last spring. Thank goodness we had the IGI testing lab set up to provide that kind of service. And then here's another picture of uh, the, this uh, woman from the firefighters uh, group arriving with that first box of samples. And then we started to see little notes on the door of our, our institute, which were really uh, very much appreciated by the team. And we knew that our work was uh, really providing important service and value in the community, something that I think everybody on the team felt uh, was deeply, um, you know, deeply important to them and, and something they wanted to spend their time doing. And I just want to uh, find, uh, uh, here's, I think this is one of my last slides. I just wanted to point out that because we have this testing lab set up now, we've been able to turn our attention back to research and think about how we can use CRISPR in a different mode than genome editing, namely as a diagnostic. And if you think about it, this is kind of how it works in nature. It allows bacteria to detect a virus and destroy it before the virus can destroy the bacterial cell. And this is done using different forms of CRISPR proteins that are called Cas13 and Cas12. And these are proteins that um, in the case of Cas13, have the ability to directly recognize RNA molecules. They don't recognize DNA at all, in fact, but they still use an RNA guided mechanism. So they use RNA to recognize RNA. That matters for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, because that's an RNA virus. So the nice thing about this kind of detection is that it's direct. We don't have to go through uh, the polymerase chain reaction, which involves making a DNA copy of that virus RNA, we can just detect the virus RNA directly. And so that's a, an approach that we've now taken uh, in the, in the uh, Innovative Genomics Institute. A number of our academic laboratories have turned their attention to this diagnostic development. And um, just for uh, uh, you chemists out there who might be curious about this, you might wonder how does CRISPR report on the presence of an RNA molecule? How do we know that it found an RNA that it's been programmed to look for? And the way this works is actually really cool. And it comes from fundamental biochemical studies of Cas13 that were done by Alexandra East Seletsky, a former graduate student in my lab, who figured out that the, um, the way that Cas13 works is to recognize RNA and turn on a cutting machine in the protein that will cut RNA that is in its immediate environment. And so if you provide a little piece of RNA that has two chemical dyes attached to the ends of this molecule, they're initially quenched. So they interact with each other and they don't release any kind of fluorescent signal. But when this chemical cleaver cuts this reporter RNA, the, 
the fluorophore is released and now you get a nice signal they can easily detect. And this is the way that these CRISPR diagnostic approaches are working is through this kind of strategy. And so we're now in the process of developing this as a point of care test. We hope that we actually can supplement our clinical testing lab with little devices that sit on a desktop and detect the SARS-CoV-2 virus RNA in saliva. So it would make it very easy to conduct surveillance testing very cheaply. And we can monitor this virus even as vaccines get increasingly uh, you know, utilized through the population, which is very important. But we do know that uh, there's still a lot to learn about this virus and we need to make sure that we keep track of it as, uh, as this pandemic, uh, hopefully we emerge from this pandemic and, and we can um, understand you know, what the level of protection is from vaccines and also what kinds of virus variants might be out there that we need to be aware of and, and protecting ourselves against. So I'm just gonna conclude by pointing out that, you know, I think for me, one of the really interesting lessons of the last year has been the power of teamwork and collaboration. I've always known that in science, you know, you often, at least for me, I often do my best work with other people, with collaborators, besides it's more fun, but this was a kind of a different level in which we had to pull together a team of many dozens of people who pitched in with their expertise to set up this testing lab and get it running efficiently so that we could provide a, a really essential service in, in our community. I also want to point out that you know, CRISPR is a great example of how curiosity-driven research propels technology. If you think about it, Emmanuel Charpentier and I, we didn't set out to discover a technology. We set out to figure out how this bacterial immune system functions. And it was only through asking those fundamental questions about the molecules and how they worked that we understood enough about the chemistry of that system that it could be harnessed as a genome editing technology, which is obviously then you know, taken both of our research laboratories in exciting new directions, as well as um, impacting the research for many other people too. And then finally, uh, what I think about uh, every day now is really uh, these issues of safety, efficacy, affordability, and access. These are all really key for the CRISPR technology to truly become a globally useful tool. And that's something that I really want to dedicate my work to in the future is making sure that we make this available to everybody that can benefit from it. And I'll just, uh, I'll stop there. I invite you to, if anybody wants to check us out on the web, please do. And um, I'm gonna stop my sharing and, and I'd love to open it up to questions that you might have. Uh, wow, thank you. That was a great presentation. If we have 15 minutes for questions, so if anyone has them, please do pop them in the chat or unmute yourself and say them out loud. Well, actually, I had a question. Um, you talk about cutting DNA, um, and you always represent it with some scissors, but I mean, obviously there aren't scissors inside your body. So how exactly does the DNA get split? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. It's chemistry. It comes down to chemistry. So it has to do with, so uh, it depends on how detailed of an answer you want, but um, but if you think about the way that the DNA uh, is put together, DNA is put together, it has a, what's called a phosphodiester backbone. So it's got phosphate atoms connected by oxygen atoms. And there's a long string of those that link together all the individual bases, which are the letters of DNA. And so what, what the Cas9 protein does is it grabs onto that, that uh, phosphate oxygen backbone of DNA, and it puts a metal ion in a position that can basically uh, trigger chemical cleavage of one specific phosphate oxygen bond. And, um, and there's actually two different chemistries going on here because uh, what I didn't tell you, but is actually important for the way this protein works is that it has two separate uh, chemical active sites. One of them uses a metal ion to cut that backbone. And the other one uses a, um, a, an amino acid called histidine to do that. 
So, but in both cases, this is important chemistry that's directed at just one particular bond in the backbone of the DNA that's determined by where that RNA guide lets Cas9 sit down on the double helix. We have some other questions in the chat. Um, Maya asks, can you talk about experiences you had growing up that you now feel were pivotal in developing your thinking and curiosity now? Sure. Well, I, you know, I grew up on the big island of Hawaii. I grew up in a town called Hilo. And, um, you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful place, it's quite rainy. My father was an English professor at the University of Hawaii, not a scientist, um, but he loved reading. And uh, when we were kids, you know, this was one of the things that we spent time doing was reading a lot of books. And as you saw in that introductory slide, one of the books that I was given by my dad was a book written by James Watson, who was one of the scientists involved in discovering the structure of the double helix of DNA. And he wrote a book about his, um, about his, uh, his research and the work of other scientists who were involved called the double helix. And when I read this book, I was probably, I don't know, 12 or 13 years old, I, uh, I, I was just astounded. I was astounded that that kind of work could get done. How could you figure out the structure of a molecule? And, you know, and it, it, it really grabbed my attention. Also, I, um, you know, I, I was quite uh, um, interested in all of the different kinds of plants and animals that evolved uniquely in Hawaii because of their isolation. And I only learned later that that's really the process of evolution at work, you know, and it really does uh, all, you know, kind of, kind of go back to the fundamentals of the DNA. You know, the DNA is changing over time and that gives these animals and plants different capabilities that make them better suited to their environmental conditions. Um, and, uh, and then I'll just, I'll just also point out that I had some really great teachers. I was a, a public school kid all the way through, but I had, you know, I just had so many opportunities to interact with uh, many different kinds of, of people. And, um, and importantly, some of my teachers along the way were very, um, you know, val valuable to me in, in showing me that science was not about memorizing facts out of a textbook. It was about solving puzzles which I love to do. Okay, I'm seeing lots of questions and Alessandra uh, or, or Anushka, I will let you guys, uh, you, you, you tell me the questions. Okay, sounds good. The next question we have um, from Milo is, I had always heard that CRISPR is not very specific with its cutting, i.e. it can cause some unexpected auxiliary changes around the target site. Considering this, how is it possible to cure sickle cell, sickle cell anemia? which is just a single flip. Wouldn't more errors be caused for that one error to be fixed? Yeah, so yeah, that's a, that is a very important question. And it's, it's, a, really, it's a really good question. Um, and, um, and so first of all, a lot of research has gone into you know, how accurate is CRISPR? How good is it? Is it? Does it get it right? Does it use the, does it find the right site that it's programmed to look for? And the answer is that most of the time it does. Uh, then, but but I said most. I didn't say all. Uh, so there are there are occasional you know off target cuts that occur that we have to guard for. And there's now a lot of uh, technology that's been developed for both detecting those um, those types of what we call off target edits as well as avoiding them. So I don't really myself feel that that's currently a bottleneck to the technology. However, you're right that it's very important to be able to detect it and to guard against it. And then to your specific question about then how do we use the technology to treat or cure sickle cell disease? And right now, the way that it was used in Victoria Gray and patients like her was actually to um, turn on a second gene called fetal hemoglobin that can suppress the effect of the mutation in the beta globin gene in patients like her. So it's, you know, it's kind of, it's a little bit of a, you know, it's not directly correcting that mutation, but it's actually activating a second gene that can then suppress that effect. However, at our institute, we're working on a way to use CRISPR that does directly correct the disease-causing mutation. How do we do that? 
Well, uh, we do it by, we have some, we have some new types of, of CRISPR tools that are better at that kind of targeted intervention in DNA. And also it's important to remember that when this is uh, used in, uh, in a sickle cell patient, the way the therapy is applied is to take blood cells from the patient, do the editing in the laboratory, and then the cells can be tested and validated and you make sure that you have cells that are edited correctly before replacing them into the patient where they then can proliferate and you know essentially create uh, new blood cells in the patient so it's you know it's kind of a uh, a way to have a double check in, in, in effect before um, allowing the cells to run loose in the body so that's one of the things that we're working on at our institute is how do we find a way to do that kind of editing, but do it in the body, but do it safely so that we don't have to use bone marrow transplantation in the future? Our next question is, what steps are you planning to, make, um, to take to make CRISPR more available or more affordable in the future? Right, well, I just mentioned one of them, and that is you know, if we could avoid having to use bone marrow transplants for people who have uh, blood disorders but need to and, and would want to be able to use CRISPR, I think that's going to reduce the cost a lot. And so that's one important strategy. The other is thinking about ways that we can more inexpensively make these molecules for clinical use. And we have a number of partnerships there, both with foundations and with companies to figure out how to do that. And you all probably are familiar with the idea that you know, if you can, if you can only make one or a few of something, it, you know, it's usually quite expensive, right? Because you have a whole infrastructure just to make a few items, uh, whether it's cell phones or computers or anything else like that. Uh, but as soon as you can make millions of them, uh, it drives the price down because there's, you know, there's more competition for one thing. And plus you get better at kind of industrializing a process so it can be uh, made less expensive. Well, I think the same thing will be true for CRISPR, and we're working on that as well. How do we make it easier uh, and faster to make the molecules that will be useful clinically? Our next question is, is CRISPR technology patented? Yes, <laughs> it is. Um, and uh, if anybody's following the uh, patents, you know, the news about CRISPR patents, you know that this has uh, been a, a longstanding um, debate and dispute, and there's a, there are um, legal uh, disputes going on between universities about you know CRISPR patents, and um, you know I, I sort of have I'm I'm I have I have multiple uh, views on this. I think on the one hand it is important for technology to be patented because it provides protection for companies that might put a lot of money, like with investors into developing that technology further. They want to know that, you know, maybe it might take five or 10 years to develop a therapy, for example. They wanna know that at the end of that timeline, they can recoup value from their investment and the risk that they took to develop the technology. That's kind of the purpose of the patent system. On the flip side, of course, you know, as I mentioned before, one of my goals is I'd like to see, you know, CRISPR technology made available to everybody that can benefit from it. So how do we do that? And you know, that's one of the reasons I work at a university and a nonprofit institute is that we're not about trying to commercialize CRISPR. We're about trying to make the technology affordable and available. And so we, we don't have to worry about patents because we're not trying to make a profit. We're just trying to do what we can to make the science and the technology uh, widely available eventually. Our next question is from Molly. How has your life been adversely and positively affected by your fame slash increased attention to your work? Well, um, you know, I have less time to think about science now, uh, which is, you know, too bad because I, I love thinking about science. Actually, I spent the day in my lab today, which was great, you know, just kind of uh, visiting with my students and talking about experiments and their data. And, you know, that was really, really fun. Um, but, you know, I, I, I realized that at some level, you know, uh, I've, I've become kind of an ambassador for science. I'm somebody that uh, for, you know, various reasons and circumstances, many of them serendipitous really, have put me in a position where I can speak to the importance of supporting science, 
uh, the importance of ethical, you know, ethical thinking in science, all of those kinds of broader questions that I'm now involved in. And, um, you know, I, you, you play the hand you're dealt, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's uh, not something I could have ever anticipated for my career, but I'm, I'm honored in a way to be, to be in that position. Um, uh, you know, but it does take away from the things that I, reasons I went into science in the first place, which is I like to do experiments. Yeah. Our next question is, you said that CRISPR could be programmed with a computer. How does that work? Uh, well, uh, programmed, I was trying to use the computer analogy, and maybe it's, maybe you'll decide it's not a good one. But the idea here is just, I wanted to point out that the, the reason this is such a powerful technology, this is really gets to the heart of why it's such a powerful technology, is that it's trivial to make CRISPR go to a desired place in the genome. So I can direct it to the sickle cell gene. I can direct it to the Huntington gene. I can direct it to the gene that causes uh, cystic fibrosis. I can direct it to genes that are responsible for those beautiful patterns in butterfly wings. It's, it's a programmable tool and that's done with the exact same protein. The same protein. I don't have to change it. I don't have to do anything about. You know, I don't have to manipulate it in any way. I can use the same protein. And how does that work? Well, I can trivially change it's the molecule of RNA that it's using to tell it where to go. And it's easy to do that in a lab. It's easy to do that in a cell. That's how bacteria program it to find lots of different viruses at the same time. So I was just trying to use the computer analogy just so that you would get a sense of how powerful it is. I mean, that's why computers are powerful, right? We can program them to do all kinds of different things. They don't just do one task. They can do lots of different things. And the same is true for CRISPR. OK, it is 4.55. So unfortunately, we are out of time for questions. But um, we are about to present awards. Um, I mean, obviously, I could present awards, but um, I think it's much cooler to have awards presented by a Nobel Prize winner than, well, by Anushka. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll pass it back to you, Dr. Dedna, um, to present the awards. Okay. Feel, well, I, oh, feel well, free to please go ahead. clap for the winners. <laughs> Absolutely, we'll clap. We will definitely clap for the winners. Um, well, it's my great honor to do this. And um, so, in, in third place, we'll start with the third place winner. We have Simran Parikh, whose submission was titled Hydrocolloid Based Non Invasive External Stitches. Woo Woo can we see you, uh, Simran? Say something. Are they here? I'm not seeing them. Um, Someone, if you're here and you want to say something, <laughs> want to say something, say it. Otherwise, we can we can say it at the end. Um, all right. Uh, moving on. In second place, we have Neha Mandeva. I hope I said your name correctly, and not too bad. Uh, not pronunciation here. And and Shaka. Uh, Raghavan and their project was a combination of computer science and chemical engineering. It was titled Utilizing NIR Spectroscopy, or is it NMR, uh, to develop an inexpensive and non invasive real time glucometer for diabetic patients. Congratulations. <laughs> And uh, Neha and uh, uh, Shaka, are either of you here? Do you want to say anything? <laughs> okay, and now uh, we are moving to our first place winner. And in first place, we have William Wong. His project was entitled Enhancing the Bionic I, a real-time image optimization framework to encode color and spatial information into retinal prostheses in the category of computer science. I don't know what that means. Uh, 
Wow, that sounds amazing. Very high tech. Um, all of you, I mean, really extraordinary projects. I can't imagine having done anything, anything like that uh, when I was uh, at your stage, but um, really cool science that you're doing. Would anybody like to, would any of the winners like to, to say anything? Don't be shy. Hi, thank you so much. I really, I really appreciate the opportunity. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> well done. Yeah. Really proud of all of you. It's really an honor for me to be participating in, in this event. And uh, I really look forward to what all the exciting science you guys are going to be doing in the future. Amazing stuff for sure. So yeah, um, cool. Congratulations to all the winners and good job on your hard work. Um, a reminder, you'll receive your prizes in the mail and make sure you keep a lookout for an email from us about it. Um, also the winning videos will be emailed to, out to everyone who signed up for the event. And if you enjoyed this and you would like to donate to the physics club, you can donate through Eventbrite at this link. I'm gonna put it in the chat. Awesome. Um, yeah, and that's all we have for you. Thank you, Dr. Denda, for coming to speak with us. It was really a pleasure and an honor to have you here. Um, and thank you, everyone else, who made the science for possible. <laughs> yes, once again, thank you for everyone for coming and have a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.